From the town council meeting of Van Buren, Indiana, population 935, July 21st, 1999. Several concerned citizens from the north end of town voiced several complaints on the houses that were brought in and left abandoned in quotations. Weeds have grown up and the houses are in great need of repair. They want the owner, Mike Helms, to get the houses fixed up or get them out of there. Mr. Helms was also in attendance and stated that if he lived there, he would be mad also. They're just, it's, it's like found poetry. I started photographing meetings because I was interested in some kind of physical manifestation of the exercise of power. And my idea was to photograph really powerful gatherings like um, boards of directors of Fortune 500 companies, uh, even the president's cabinet. I didn't rule it out and started to pursue and make some inquiries about it. And I didn't even know where this came from, but one night I decided to go to a, a local town council meeting. And as soon as I walked in the room, it just, the situation seemed really beautiful to me. And I realized that that would be a really great direction to go in. After that, I started spending my time researching, and I think it was five or six years, uh, photographing community meetings all across the United States. I put together a database to find out when these communities were having their meetings. For instance, I'd be in southern Indiana, and it would be the second Tuesday of the month, and I could wake up in the morning at my motel and punch that into the computer, second Tuesday, southern Indiana population less than 2,000. And it would give me a list of communities that were meeting on that evening, and then I could plot them on a map. I'm gonna go here, 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 and here. I was visiting places I would never have any reason to go to. And meeting and hearing really interesting things. That was the most fun I ever had doing a project. For me, the hardest part of any project is coming up with the idea. I think you can learn how to be a photographer, how to work the equipment. I think you can learn visually how to compose interesting photographs. But to me, it just doesn't really have that juice unless there's an idea behind it. I teach and I talk to my students about this a lot and I tell them to follow your passions or your fears or whatever it is you feel strongly about. And looking back on all my projects, I could, I don't always know it at the time that I embark on the project, but either partway through or even after it's finished, I, I can look back and sort of figure out where the germ of that idea came from. I grew up during the Cold War and we did exercises when I was in grade school, hiding under our desks or going down to the fallout shelter in the school basement. And so it, it makes a big impression on a young person, you know, this idea that at any second, without any warning, the world might end. And uh, I just thought of the idea, well, these things are real, they're not invisible, nuclear weapons, that is, and uh, why couldn't I see them and take photographs of them? which was really kind of a ridiculous idea, but um, it, I was able eventually to succeed in getting access to, to some degree. So for me, it was like going to see the boogeyman, you know, something that really played a major part of my psychological makeup. And I, I think really a lot of people of my generation There you have it. Fun with weapons of mass destruction. For many years, I've been collecting photographs from lost pet posters. Initially, I was walking around with a little point and shoot camera in my pocket. And whenever I saw one of those posters, I would photograph just very close in on just the photograph of the pet. And at first, 
I just found them amusing and also kind of beautiful. Um, you know, they're up on phone poles for months and months and they start to get very tattered and to me that makes them more interesting. I guess I was interested in the, in the implied pathos of these uh, photographs of lost pets. This guy looks so sad and you can't see his eyes. Three years ago, my interest in it sort of changed. I had a, a family member uh, who suffered an injury and uh, I became familiar with the concept of ambiguous loss. The idea that a person or a pet could be physically absent but still psychologically present in some way. And that kind of caused me to look again at the photographs that I had taken of the photographs of the lost pets. And they kind of took on a, I guess, a, a richer meaning for me. This photograph to me is, is a really wonderful example because the basic image itself is very interesting. It's a very soulful and sad picture of this dog. But the poster has been left out in the rain, so the ink is running, which visually just does some interesting things. It separates the colors into their primary components where it might print as brown, but when it runs, you'll see the yellow and you'll see the red. I enhance the color usually by increasing the saturation somewhat, but I don't change them significantly. I'm still experimenting with them and I, I'm printing them very large on canvas, so I really do think of them as functioning as, as paintings in a certain way. It's, it's a really radical shift in direction for me as an artist and a photographer. My ideas about photography and what I'm interested in have changed quite a bit uh, many times over the years. This new work, in, in a way, I don't know if it's risky or not, but it certainly is not in a lineage that anyone who knows my previous work would look at this and say, oh, that's, you know, that's by Paul. But I'm, I'm okay with that. I think it's true of any artist, you know, if you allow your work to speak somehow to what's inside you, even though my work up till now has primarily been dealing with external issues in the world, with political or social issues, um, I make it for a reason that I'm interested in those things or I'm curious about those things. You know, I guess I learn about myself in hindsight at these projects because those are the projects I choose. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.